there was an event called the Dialectics for the Congress of Liberation, wonderfully pretentious title, um, conjured up by the anti R.D. Lang and the anti-psychiatrists in Camden Town, and using an old, old railway share. And they brought together a, a bunch of luminaries of all sorts. They brought uh, people like Marcuse, uh, Paul Goodman, uh, Stokely Carmichael, Emmett Grogan, and Allen Ginsberg. And I, I proposed to uh, West German television that we should make a film about this. You know, this was quite arrogant as a 22-year-old or something. And uh, they asked for a script, and I wrote something on the back of a piece of paper quickly over a weekend, and then was astonished to say, well, yeah, we'll do it. We'll make this film. And at the same time, there was a, there was a gathering of poets on the South Bank, um, and one of which was Charles Olson. So my interest in Olson was actually greater than the, the interest in Ginsberg. I was interested in Ginsberg in his own way, and, and thought him a kind of a fascinating poetry politician and mover and shaker, and the way he crossed across various worlds, and the way he was very generous to, to people was extraordinary, uh, to, to the extent that I just found out from underground contacts in magazines and things where, where he was living, which was in a grand house off in Re near Regent's Park, and they said, well, you know, go round and ring on the door. So I just went round to this house, rang on the door, and an elegant woman came up with a, a sort of quizzical smile on her face, called Panna Grady. And she said, oh yeah, you, yeah, Alan likes making films. He's out in the summer house at the back. He'll, he's out at some party now, but he, you know, you can wait here and he'll come back later tonight and he, yeah, he, he'll do a film for you. And you know, we didn't, so that was how it was. And it, off it went. And we got talking and then it, I discovered that not only that, but that Olsen had been living in this house until quite recently. And uh, so the beginnings of that intriguing story, uh, which I think began in Gloucester, or had its roots in Gloucester, w were teased out. And I went down to the South Bank to see this poetry reading. And I'm just going to read you a scrap from a book that I wrote at that time. <coughs> it's, it's, a, it's a very strange looking book, as you'll see. Um, it was very much in the, in the mood of the 1960s. Uh, you'd have your own press. Uh, there, was a, there was a Canadian book called Ant's Forefoot, which came out in this format. But I wanted something that looked like a movie, so you could actually put in um, you know, the photographs that were done, like film frames, and the text was there. And it's a sort of innocent eye view, really. Uh, but, uh, but with all its faults, it, it uh, is an engaging diary of this moment. And I'd like to do it because it's the first time I, and indeed the only time, I actually set eyes on Charles Olson. Our seats are in the ceiling, and we look down at the stage like high divers at a bucket of water. A large, bulky man in a dirty, tropical suit sprawled out in the aisle beside us, a remarkable, heavy Nordic skull, large, grey tails of hair hung from the back of his balding dome, eyebrows. His eyes were clenched into the face under dusty spectacles, a big thumb of a nose. It would be very difficult to step round this man. It was Charles Olson. You should give him your seat, said Chris, who was next to me. But this was not a man for seats. He sprawled on the floor, using it like a deck. An attendant approached him. Olson lifted his paw and pulled the man down towards his ear. There were mutterings. The attendant went away. <laughs> he returned. Olsen, grunting like a bear, reluctantly went with him to re-emerge onto the stage, frowning out into the light. The reading itself was very predictable, which is the nature of these things. It is what the people pay for. There was old Auden, the withered public man in carpet slippers, who had his verses by heart. There was Spender, fluttering in the breeze of the fans like a pink establishment flower. <laughs> The audience was attentive and distracted. There was a polite sprinkling of applause. Nothing was risked and nothing was gained. It was like a board meeting, and the poems were last year's stock quotations. <laughs> Olson closed the in before the interval, and he briefly changed the level of the proceedings. Presumably good judges, like the publisher Stuart Montgomery, considered this reading a failure, and to the extent that the environment formed a conditioning factor, it did fail. 
whose Olsen was given no time, and the hall itself was antiseptic, and the earlier poets created a spidery musk of deadness. But Olsen rose above it for a few moments with a strength of conviction. He had trouble with his voice, and he coughed, and he cleared his throat, and he drank half a jug of water in two gulps, and he wiped his mouth with the back of his hand, and he waited, and he waited, until he was absolutely ready, and he blew it. And he started again, and he went dry, and he started a third time, and he made it, and he swayed into it, and he saw it become live and real, and he did not try to hide the struggle and the effort it cost him. But it was not a showman thing, it was not faking the danger. He was just making the audience sweat, and he read an ode on nativity, which he excused as a sentimental trifle. All cries rise, and the three of us observe how fast Orion marks midnight at the climax of the sky. While the boat of the moon settles as red in the southwest as the orb of her was for this boy once, the first time he saw her whole Halloween face northwest across the skating pond as he came down to the ice, December in his seventh year. He worked it, the long rushes of breath, the runs, letting each line have its pull. It was an excitement, heart in mouth to listen, and he beat out the time with the ball of his fist, and the other hand was rubbing at his throat. So here we were, we had a demonstration of the projective verse method, the use of breath, the, the, the dance, the dance of the poem, all of that. And of course this is a poem, one of the few, I think, set in Worcester rather than in Gloucester. And it's the same poem that he, he uh, read again in the Berkeley conference so many years later. And the energies of the time were, were very much circling around these figures for London. And, and this is what I'm trying to do. This is, this is Olsen and Gloucester from the other side. And we're looking back at it in this mirror. It seemed a very significant place. The idea that you would dig in, you would dig into this place, you would look at the sea, you would see yourself as these first of last men. You would see the significance of somewhere that is actually, in human terms, so recent as you feel it when you come here. These sort of bogus, prehistoric picnicking tables. Astonishing thing. Uh, and the idea of the quarries all around, all of that. So the, the human debate and discussion with this is recent and nervous in some ways. But, but we took it on and we all thought this was, this was it. And uh, so did the others. The interconnections of that period were so extraordinary that when the, uh, the Cambridge scholar Gregory Bateson was there, he was, he was talking about ecology. He was talking about the polar ice caps melting. He was talking about the consequences of all that in 1967. And these poets and activists of every stripe were very engaged with these things as metaphors. And you got the sense every night as they went away from this railway shed, where by now all the tribes of London are sleeping on the floor. They're all in there. It's not like this place is now. Um, it's an absolute, it's a yurt, it's a camp for shamanic tribes moving across. They're all going out and they're having these conversations every night and they're bumping off each other. So when I went back to Ginsburg after the first week and said, look, I'm very sorry, but the cameraman has just reported from the labs that the film is all black. Can we come back and do it again? Um, he agreed. He, uh, <laughs> If I did it now, you know, we'd be much hipper. We'd say the film was all black. We have a black film, and we have, we, you sit in the dark and watch the sun. <laughs> but then we felt we had to deliver images. So, okay. He, and Ginsburg couldn't do it straight away because um, he had disappeared. And where he had disappeared to was uh, South Wales, my own territory. He'd gone to Llantony Abbey with Tom Mashler, the publisher, and he'd climbed up onto the hills and had this uh, Blakean vision of the English pastoral, this sort of sense of rolling cloud. It was an LSD-enhanced vision, and he wrote uh, Wales of Visitation. So in a sense, he derived at a point that I got to writing books many years later, before me. I didn't know that at the time. He came back to London, um, very disturbed because his companion, Peter Olofsky, had freaked out in New York and smashed all the windows in their building and had been taken into Bellevue. And, but he was still prepared to talk. And what he was talking about, the thing that had gripped him most in all this was Olsen. And he went into a, 
uh, a sheer kind of polemic performance, which I transcribed in this book, more or less in the form of verse, because that's how it sounded, all about Olson's vision of the world at that time, which again, we carried away with us and became so important. And I'll read that to you, a bit of it anyway. Um, he says, Olson says that now everyone can select their own images Everyone is onto the fact that language is controlling them on a massive electronic scale. So this consciousness grows and the people start cutting out of the imagery that's being planted in their brains. And anybody is free to interpret history as he actually sees it. So history becomes what happened rather than what we are told is happening. Olson is saying that history is ended in the sense that the old means of manufacturing history are called into question and also the population explosion and the electronics information network and the fact of our leaving the planet, the atom bomb, the shortage of food, the ecological disturbances caused by heavy metal industries. They have all changed the environment so much that the old conditions of history have changed. They're no longer like they were during what we knew as history, the place where the skies are open and where the sky is the limit. We can leave the planet. We can destroy the planet. We've never had history with those possibilities. We've had little wars in Asia, and we've had wars between America and Europe, but we've never had a whole planet that could blow itself up. And we're changing the weather, and we're making carbon dioxide all over, and we're raising the temperature of the Earth, and we're melting the polar ice cap, and we're causing a flood again. And in that sense, maybe history was over, with the first atomic explosion took place in the Gobi Desert 20,000 years ago, which is William Burroughs' theory and that the whole white race is a mutant aberration caused by that explosion, an aberration characterized by an intense need to have somebody to look down on, somebody to order around, somebody to be inferior, and we've come again to the end of that cycle. Electronic bugging machinery makes everybody's private life public, and what was thought to be proper public behavior is no longer appropriate, and everything that's inter interconnected electronically all our obsessions have to be out front. All the information has to be on the table. So we've got a giant public tolerance of all forms of madness and perversion. History is over in the old, formal, dignified, secret thing which maintained the hypocrisy so that people could get away with symbolic forms that hid their feelings. Uh, so, so he went on. And it was, uh, it was uh, all, all cast around the, the Magus-like figure of Olsen with his size and his huge presence. And in a sense, he, that the two shadows that dominated this event, although neither of them were taking place directly, uh, and, and one of the other one was there, was William Burroughs, who was a skeletal, suited, mysterious, um, paranoid, and Olsen, generous, open, open field, all of that. The, the two things were there, and all that we did was coming out of those places. After this period, I, I settled, and I'm sorry for the kind of autobiographical strand, anecdotally, that's going through it, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a device for taking us through the time period and showing you how, how Olsen began to dig and bite into, into where we were over there and how we look back across at this. I started to realize that, that this whole business of trying to be commissioned to do something was crazy. So uh, I, I stopped doing anything that was for a public form of filming. I started to do diary films of a community of people that moved into houses in the East End of London where it was very cheap. And they were inspired by uh, an Olsen contact, the American filmmaker Stan Brackage, with his idea of songs. And within, within the structure of the Olsen poetry, as we were getting it, beginnings of the Maximus, you saw that there were these strands that were either letters, like letters to Farini, or letters to other people, letters that become poems, or there were songs, which is a, a slightly higher engagement with things in a different register. And, and the song became the kind of thing we were doing as film. And I felt you should publish your own work, you should stand up for it, and you should earn your living just any way, which way. So I was doing things like working in breweries, uh, working dock work, emptying containers, and, and most importantly being a gardener along the river in London and uh, cutting the grass of Nicholas Hawksmoor's churches, which gave me plenty of time to think about them and to evolve strange theories about how they might interconnect. 